All right, so welcome back. And in this video, we are pretty much going to finish off the um, the presentation from the uh, the fifth presentation from the third week about lasers. And we are going to discuss the mechanism of formation of laser. Uh, we're going to be um, utilizing the two uh, principles that we learned in the last uh, video of population inversion and stimulated emission. We're going to go through some basic applications. And again, give credit where credit to do is due. This awesome presentation is brought to us by Professor Janusz, and he made uh, a really pretty impressive presentation, very informative, very, um, very interesting. It has a lot of visuals and uh, makes it easier to enjoy. And uh, also, uh, almost as an animated form of looking at how a laser is made. So we're going to look at that as well. But before we do, uh, mechanism is based on, and we already learned that, population inversion. And if you don't know what these things are, I encourage you to go to the last video and look at it. And stimulated emission. Stimulated emission. And let's just say I have my laser tube. And we're already talking about my laser tube, which is great. And now, in the laser tube, I have my rear mirror. This is a mirror in the rear. Rear mirror. And I have my front mirror. And my front mirror has, you can say, a small hole in it, very, very small microscopic. Uh, path that photons can go through. And I'm going to show you how this works in a second. This means that light, photons can actually escape through here. And they can actually only escape in a specific orientation that would cause them all to be in the same vector direction and polarized. So this essentially promotes polarized laser light. And also you can imagine that any in any other direction light is going to be bounced off from different areas in this tube. Perfect. And also, what, uh, what's important to understand, just a review of the different energy levels, is if I, if I have my three energy levels here, I'm going to extend this a little bit, and I have my electron, I pumped it, it absorbed the energy, got up to this level, relaxed to this level, and now it has it has stored energy, and it's waiting for me to um, to stimulate it. And now as I'm stimulating it with a photon, and this is just a review from the last video, this photon I'm using it to stimulate this electron with is just going to be bounced off. Following that, this photon is going to relax rapidly and also emit a photon. So you can consider me getting two photons for the price of one. And that's kind of important to understand. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, make this make this thing a little larger so it'll be easier to work with. There you go. This is one mirror. This is the other mirror. It has that little it has that little kink in it. There we go. Perfect. This is kind of a skew, but we'll make do with that. Now what I do is, and we already learned that, I'm pumping the system with energy. pumping the system with energy. And following that pumping, I'm going to have more molecules in the excited states. And obviously, this is gross oversimplifying. I'm going to have a few in the ground state, which I'm not really interested in. And now all I really need, after I've done the population inversion, is the second principle, the stimulated emission. And I'm going to shoot a photon at this molecule this photon is going to interact with this molecule. I'm going to get, again, a 2 for the price of 1. And maybe I'm going to have one photon going this way, one photon going this way. Maybe this photon reacts with this molecule. I'm going to have one going that way, one going that way, bouncing off, going this way. This photon maybe is going to interact with this molecule. And I'm going to have one bouncing this way, one bouncing this way. This photon will maybe interact with this molecule. And this molecule is going to bounce photons off. And as you can actually see, we're going to have an exponential increase in our photon intensity 
the number of photons over a very short amount of time. And as you can imagine, light moves pretty quickly in these uh, tubes. And we're just essentially going to have photons bouncing back and forth and only exiting through this cavity right here. And this is a good time to mention how this mirror is called. We mentioned the rear mirror. And this mirror is basically called the outcoupling out coupling mirror. And out coupling in physics basically means the escaping of photons that were generated um, after uh, they were generated by a diode. Basically, this is the escaping of photons, a mirror that would allow the escaping of photons, an out coupling mirror. And now I'm going to take the time to see, or rather show you, how uh, Professor Janusz built it in his presentation. Pretty impressive stuff. There we go. So this is the first slide. And I have this, this whole area as my already population inverted tube. And I have here my emission. And now it's going to go back and forth. Sorry, back and forth through the first mirror, go back. Then it's going to double. Then it's go back through the, uh, the back mirror. And here we can actually see that the rear mirror is not really uh, pervious. And the front mirror is out coupling. There's, there's a percentage here that you can see that light can actually go through. This is where light comes out of. And this is the actual, uh, this is the actual mechanism. This is the actual mechanism. And I wouldn't go as far as saying that this is, uh, this is easy, although some people may find this easy, but it's pretty, it's, it makes sense. I would say it makes sense. I pump the system. After I pump the system, I have a lot of excited molecules. And when I, uh, and when I stimulate emission, I have two for the price of one, so to speak, and doubling an exponential increase in the, in the photon density here until they all come out polarized, monochromatic, um, high energy and very uh, coherent through time and space. Very nice. And now that we've looked at mechanism, let's keep on going. And this is um, this is an interesting lecture slide. Before I'm going to get to this, what I want to uh, to go through is that if you go through the presentation, there is a lot of information. I'm slowly scrolling down. A lot of information. These are all different lasers and types and mechanisms and what makes them work. What puffy mechanisms are work. I just want to review here for a second. Uh, there's this nice table here, and you don't really need to, I would imagine that you need to remember any of what's going on here. But you can see that under the pumping, under the pumping column here, you can see the different mechanisms that can be used respectively for each, uh, for each laser mechanism. You can either use electric pulse, laser light, uh, flash lamp, xenon lamp, and a current. These are all ways to achieve population inversion. And now that we're scrolling down, we're going to see different types of, uh, of, um, of uh, lasers. And what I would make a point to do, what I uh, encourage you to make a point of doing, is remembering at least one type of laser. You can either remember the CO2 laser, because this is a substance that is mentioned a lot in everyday lives, and we come in contact with it. Maybe it's easier to remember. Um, it's easy to remember maybe the diode lasers, because these are the lasers that our professors use in the lecture halls. These are the diode lasers. And now let's get to this slide here. Now this slide basically shows us that we can have different energy levels for our lasers. The, this energy level could always be increasing. But we can either have uh, um, low energy lasers that can heat, lasers that can excite fluorophores, lasers that can have uh, photochemical interactions with the material, or if I have very high, very energetic lasers, I can either, I can also be talking about photo disassociation, or ionization, which is really the breaking of chemical bonds and causing ionization, very high energetic uh, lasers. What we need to understand is that we can also, we can use lasers for both diagnostic and therapeutic methods. And in the presentation, there's a few interesting, um, interesting pictures and uh, examples for that. This is the coagulation of blood vessels in, um, in a diabetic's eye that obviously uh, affect for the worse, they have a, a, an effect for the worse on the vision mechanism and can be dealt with using laser. 
Also, coagulation of blood vessels that are very close to the surface of the skin can also potentially be dealt with uh, lasers. And we also have eye surgery, which is um, which is reshaping of the cornea. That is also uh, it's also shown here. There you go, reshaping of the cornea. And this is all good to uh, read because we're all going to be uh, medical doctors, or some of us at least would like to be. So it's nice to get a hold of these things. But I wouldn't make a point to remembering all of these all of this information. So what I'm going to go down and focus on are these two, photodynamic diagnostics and photodynamic therapy. And I'm using these two because, first of all, if I need an, an exam, and it's really important because we're actually learning for exams here. We're not all going to be uh, laser physicists. Um, if we're going to be asked to give um, an example for a diagnostic uh, um, utilization of lasers or therapeutic, uh, methods of using laser, we can use either one of the two. And they're actually pretty close together as far as how they work. And also I noticed that the professor was speaking at length about these two, so I imagine maybe these two are slightly more important, but again, this is just intuition. So uh, let's take a look at these. First of all, the photodynamic diagnosis, and this is actually not going to take more than a minute to go through. This is pretty simple. Well, we already know what fluorophores are, and what we can do is we're assuming that we have these, these cancerous tumors inside this gentleman's body. And what we do is that we have a dye that we prepare. That dye, as we inject it into that gentleman's body, is going to course through the, um, the blood and is actually essentially going to attach to the tumor itself. This fluorescent dye is specific to this uh, tumor tissue. That means it's going to associate with it and stick with it. And now after I've injected this dye and it coursed through the veins and it got to the uh, tumor and it associated itself with the tum tumor tissue, I know that I have tumors that can now fluoresce. And what I do now is I'm taking this laser. Here it's a krypton laser. And this laser is within the absorption spectrum of the respective fluorescent dye here. And I insert it. Here it's through the person's mouth. <laughs> Looks pretty happy about that. And then I can actually excite the fluorophores that are associated with the tumors. And, I, and the tumors would actually fluoresce. It'll be easy, very, very easy for me to to see them. And although this doesn't look very comfortable, it is not a very evasive, uh, invasive, um, invasive maneuver if you consider surgery, which is pretty, pretty invasive. In this section here, what we see is an oxygenated tumor tissue. Oxygenated just means it has O2. This is oxygenated. And O2, which is something that we should know and we will know, O2 can be, uh, we can use some energy to take O2 stable molecules and break them up into radicals of different forms. And we're not really, I'm not really going to depict all the radicals, but radicals are, are basically very, very reactive species uh, due to them having unpaired electrons in their orbitals. And these radicals are going to interact with their uh, surrounding tissue and they're going to destroy it. So you can think about it as we can destroy this tissue from within just by creating radicals. How do we do that? First of all, we can identify where this tumor is by exciting the, uh, the fluorophores with a dye laser. And then after we identify where it is, we can create, we can create the mechanisms by this argon laser, this ion laser which would effectively cause the formation of oxygen radicals from oxygen molecules. And these oxygen radicals are just going to slowly eat up at the tumor and they're going to break it apart. And this photodynamic therapy is actually pretty interesting. You can find some information about it online. And uh, if you're interested in it, it's, it's a nice read if you have time, which obviously I don't expect you have too much of, but it's always nice. So again, if we're talking about preparing for an exam, uh, an example of using uh, laser for therapy, an example of using laser for diagnostic, can laser be used to 
in a in a low energy state, yes, or in a higher energy state, also yes. What is the basic mechanism? We have a population inverted tube that was pumped. Um, it has two mirrors. One of them is not previous. One of them is out coupling. Photons can get out in specific orientation. And uh, that's pretty much it. Hopefully you have found this helpful. And I'll see you in the next presentation.